Does anyone use the expression, your Sunday best anymore? I don't think I've heard that. Uh, best meaning your fanciest outfit, dressing up, and Sunday because one of the only times people dressed up on a regular basis was to go to church. And while there are still a few gentlemen here who wear jackets and ties, and Kathy has her fabulous hats, for the most part, the days of white gloves and patent leather shoes are history. Do I get an amen and a hallelujah on that? When I began in ministry as a student assistant pastor, and my senior pastor loved to refer to me as his sap, student assistant pastor, you get it, right? Um, that congregation had the tradition of the Sunday before Labor Day asking people to come in their regular work clothes to give us a sense of Labor Day. And it was hard for some of the folks because this was a church in Howard County and some of the people, for them, their work clothes were coveralls or overalls or uniforms. And for others, there were doctors and lawyers and stockbrokers and their, their Sunday clothes were hard to distinguish from their work clothes. And it made some distinguishing between, some distinctions between people that could be uncomfortable or embarrassing. But about 10 years ago, I was serving a different church, and in that congregation, there were many motorcycle enthusiasts. Do we have any motorcycle riders here? There were quite a few out there, and they wanted to have what is called a blessing of the bikes. That was a time before the worship service. We went into the parking lot, we invited bikers to come, and we prayed for the safety of all who ride motorcycles. We advertised the event by contacting some local riding clubs, and we used social media. And I admit I was surprised when over 30 bikers came to church that morning, mostly in leather and in dark glasses at 11 o'clock in the morning. Some of them had on chains, and everybody had multiple, multiple weird tattoos. But there was one married couple, and they were dressed in leather from head to toe, but their outfits were covered with patches, as you often see on bikers. They had an American flag, they had their riding club, they had different insignias, but the one that stuck out that they both had right on the front of their vests is a patch I will never forget because it read, these are my church clothes. Now, I didn't know who I expected to show up that day. We'd never done anything like that before. But I know that I was surprised to find out that so many of these bikers were practicing regular, devout Christian people. The couple with the matching patches actually traveled with their own vial of anointing oil because they were always ready to pray with people in need or to witness to them about the power of Jesus Christ, especially to those who may not feel welcome going into a church because they're dressed in leather and chains and tattoos and dark glasses at 11 o'clock in the morning. Now, they had, in fact, invited some of the people who had come that day. And I'm sure some of them just simply came out of curiosity to see what might happen if they were blessed. And some stayed in the parking lot, but a lot of them actually came in for the worship service. Now, during worship, the married couple with the anointing oil and the these are my church clothes patches shared a story with me that I will always remember. They had gone to Florida recently, and they traveled all over the country on their bikes. They were retired. They had gone to Florida to see Joyce Meyer. Do you know who she is, the televangelist? They had waited for years to see her. And they finally were able to get tickets to one of her conferences, and the tickets cost over $100 each. Now, I've got to admit, I don't remember what their names were, but I do remember that the man said he felt like Moses when he went into this arena. He said everywhere we went, people parted like they were the Red Sea. Because no one, no one, not one person at that convention spoke to them. Even when the speaker said, turn to your neighbor and share, nobody spoke to them because they could not accept that these two people wearing leather were their brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus really understood human nature. And I think he understood how little it was going to change in 2,000 years. Because when he dined at the home of the prominent Pharisee in the 14th chapter of Luke that we read today, you have to understand what prominent means. It implies wealth, a big house, a big party, and a lavish meal. And this Pharisee may have invited Jesus just simply out of curiosity because people were talking about him. Or perhaps he invited him because he respected him as a rabbi of note. 
We can't be sure of the motivation behind that invitation, but we know that it happened on the Sabbath and that Jesus was being watched very carefully. The verses we skip talk about that event. Jesus heals a man with what was called in scripture times dropsy, what we call edema. He healed him on the Sabbath, and while the people there didn't comment on it, you knew what they were thinking. He had broken the Sabbath by working. And while Jesus is under this much scrutiny, he decides he's going to challenge the other guests at the party by telling them the parable that we just read. He warns against claiming a position of honor that might have been reserved for some VIP. Imagine the humiliation of being told to move from your seat. Maybe you're told at Thanksgiving dinner to move to the kitty table or in a restaurant to the table by the kitchen door or maybe for some to the back of the bus to go to the cheap seats. Picture yourself in middle school, or for some of us, that was junior high. Can you all get a picture of that? The cafeteria, the great dividing walls between people there. What would happen to a not cool kid who went to the cool kid's table and sat down? What would have happened? Raise your hand if you were one of the cool kids. You're not going to admit to that, are you? I can tell you what would happen. You would be thrown out on your ear. Jesus is saying it's better to be invited to move up in the world than to be taken down. And what does he do next? But he turns his attention, his focus, and his critique upon the host, telling him to expand his guest list the next time. Don't just be satisfied with inviting those who are able to repay your hospitality or to grant you social or political favors. Jesus says invite the disabled the people who can't walk or hear or see, and others who could not afford to feed themselves, much less a crowd or even one lone prominent Pharisee. But I want you to fast forward a couple of millennia to my grandfather's era. My grandfather was obsessed with his Christmas card list, obsessed. He sent hundreds of Christmas cards, and he recorded every one that he received back. But mark my words, if he sent you a card in 1973 and he didn't get one back in 1974, you were not going to get a card from him. There was even a year when he didn't get one back from the White House, and he always loved to show, or more accurately, show off his card from the President and First Lady to anybody who stopped by at Christmas time. But one time he did not get a card back from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and that was it. One strike and you are out with him. He never sent another Christmas card to the President. We do have a tendency, don't we, to expect reciprocity? A card for a card, or it's their turn to have us to dinner, we had them last time, or I paid last time we went out. And to be honest, we are probably no more likely to invite a homeless person to have Thanksgiving dinner with our family than the Pharisee was. But the rigid distinctions between the rich and the poor and the haves and the have-nots in the first century were a lot more rigid and stringent than they are even today more so than we can imagine, because the Greco-Roman influence had come even into the Jewish community, and they demanded payback. They even invented that famous line that we still use, quid pro quo, a Latin phrase, because in that culture, humility was certainly not a virtue. And to put out a spread like the one the Pharisee put out for his guests demanded a reward. So why wouldn't you, if you were invited, feel entitled to sit close to the host. But Jesus has a very different value system, one centered in God's kingdom, one that calls for a radical form of hospitality. And the reward for this radical hospitality, Jesus says, will be realized at the resurrection. Those who humble themselves will be exalted, and those who exalt themselves will be humbled. The unnamed writer of the letter to the Hebrews echoes the sentiment, let love be mutual, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some of you have entertained angels without knowing it. Or if you prefer it in King James, some of you have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured as though you yourselves were being tortured. And he ends with, do not neglect to do good and share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So how many angels may have walked by us unnoticed? Or worse yet, how many times were we the Red Sea that parted when someone 
came by who didn't seem like someone with whom we would like to party or invite to our home. In a few weeks, we're going to spend a whole Sunday morning and a whole Sunday afternoon focused on mission. We're going to hear the stories of those who were able to form community, which is church and family, by giving their time and giving their hearts. We're going to hear what they received back, not in monetary reward or that kind of payback, but I've seen the pictures of our mission teams, both the one that traveled to North Carolina and those who worked here at Baltimore County. And I can tell you what their Sunday best looks like. T-shirts, blue jeans, work gloves, steel-toed boots. That's their Sunday best. Uh, I wish I could buy you all a patch that says, these are my church clothes, and sew it onto whatever you wear to work every day. Because it's not about what we wear in this building that matters at all. What we wear here doesn't show what we believe. It's what we take from this place into the world that tells the world what we believe about Jesus Christ. Because, brothers and sisters, you are the church. You are the body of Christ. And you have been invited to the feast. And you've been given the best seat in the house because you have a place at the table. You're here and I am here not because we are entitled by what we've done right. We are here because of God's grace revealed to us in Jesus Christ. No other reason are we here. And we are then called to go out into the world to invite others to the table so they can know what Christ has done for them as well. There was another congregation that I served years ago, and I was the associate pastor. There were two pastors on staff, and a man came in one day from the rescue mission. I remember his name because his name was Terry, and we were exactly the same age. Terry had gone to the rescue mission first as a resident before he ended up working there. He had been a carpenter, a very skilled carpenter. He'd built his own house. He had a wife. He had children. He had a good living in New Jersey. But then he became addicted to alcohol and cocaine. First he lost his job. Then he lost his house. Then his wife said, it's us or the drugs, and he picked the drugs. And so he lost his wife and his children. He had nothing to keep him in New Jersey and no place to live. His wife had taken their children and gone back home to be with her parents. And so he decided he would take his tools and his tool bag and hitchhike south because this was right after Hurricane Andrew in Florida, and they would hire anybody who could build. But they stopped in Frederick, Maryland. He had hitchhiked with a trucker, and he couldn't even afford a cup of coffee at the place. But he went in to use the men's room, and he came out, and the trucker had taken off with his tools. So this was a man who literally had no money in his pocket and the clothes on his back. And he went to the rescue mission because he had no other choice. He went there knowing that he could get a meal, he could get a shower, he could have a bed for the night. He knew he would have to sit through a sermon, and at that point it seemed like a little price to pay. What he didn't expect was that the sermon was going to grab hold of his heart that he was going to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ who loved him in spite of the mess he had made of his life and who was ready to redeem him. And he gave his life to Jesus Christ at that moment. And there have been very few times in my life when I have seen someone turn away from addiction and never look back. He got clean, he got sober, and he could have gone back to a very lucrative occupation. And instead, he accepted a job at the rescue mission because he felt that Christ had redeemed him so that he could call others to the feast. I'm listening to this story from him, and I'm so moved. And then he says, what I would like to know is if I could bring some of the guys from the mission here, because some of them, he said, I run a 12-step program for alcohol. I run a 12-step program for drugs. And some of them have come to understand that their higher power, if you're familiar with the 12-step program, is Jesus Christ. And they want to find a church where they can worship. And I said, certainly you're welcome. And he said, wait, 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 I haven't finished yet. And then he went on to tell me this was the third church they'd been to. You have to understand, these were men who were like Terry. They had the clothes on their back, and the clothes on their back reeked of cigarette smoke. They had blue jeans that were threadbare, and holy t-shirts with an E. They had been to other churches, and the second time they came, they were asked not to come back again because they were making the women feel uncomfortable. 
And I was certain that my congregation wouldn't be like that, and I said, you are welcome here. And they came, and they came back, and the third time they came, my senior pastor, and I'm not trying to blame him, he came to me and said, you've got to get rid of these guys. Because we were in a capital funds campaign. We needed millions of dollars to build a new sanctuary. What he said to me that he wanted me to share with them was I'm sure they would be more comfortable someplace else. Wouldn't we all be more comfortable in a place that didn't judge us? Wouldn't we all be more comfortable in a place that took us in spite of our brokenness to heart and gave us a home and a family? I'm sure the angels feel that way. Those who exalt themselves will be brought down a peg, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. We need to go into the world offering people hope and wholeness and healing through our Savior Jesus Christ because we remember what it was like to be in that place. Maybe you weren't homeless, maybe you weren't addicted, but you were a sinner, because you're still a sinner, because I know that, because I'm still a sinner. But I know that God can change lives. But we have to come to the table, not seeking the place of honor, but understanding what an honor it is just to be included. And that's why we will move over to make room for the next one, and the one after that, and the one after that and the one after that. What is it they say about paybacks? Some of you have heard that expression. Paybacks can be heck. <laughs> but the reward at the resurrection is knowing that the place at the table here is the place that we will sit for all eternity with Jesus Christ, our Lord. For me, that is a promise that I can trust. And for me, that's the call to go into the world, to invite others to the grace that I have found through my Lord and Savior and your Lord and Savior, our Lord and Savior. Praise be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing.